And we're back. This is Columbia Calling. I am Richard McColl, your host here in Bogota, Colombia, 2,600 meters closer to the stars. And I'm thrilled to be able to introduce to you a very special guest this week. Every week it's a special guest, but a very special guest because we've been chatting since last year about getting together, about recording this, and we've managed to get her before she leaves to Sao Paulo to study her doctorate. Uh, her name, Sara Bufano. She's Italo-Colombian, so half Italian, half Colombian. And she has a fascinating story of upbringing from the age of 10 in Colombia. She was obviously born in Italy, raised until the age of 10. Uh, she's just brought out a book well, in Colombia called Colombia, una herida que no cierra los procesos de paz de los años 80. So it deals with the different peace processes in the 1980s. Now, this book is an excellent book in Spanish. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it there. Uh, it's dense. It's full of information. But before we get into that, Sara, thank you so much for your time and agreeing to share some of your story here on the Columbia Calling podcast. Yeah. Hello? Hello, no te tengo. Sorry. Yes, hi, hi, Richard. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, you got I, me now? I was saying it. Yes, I was saying <laughs> it's really nice to meet you, and I'm really happy to be here in your podcast. No, it's a, it, the pleasure is mine, and the pleasure is that of my listeners. And um, you know, we've been going for hundreds of episodes now, and to me, it's always important to get different academic voices on the podcast to discuss not only their backgrounds, but what is going on in Colombia. And I, I think as you are a sociologist, Italo-Colombiana, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your upbringing because there are some twists and turns there that are <laughs> so interesting. But perhaps you could give us a brief uh, background. Yes, of course, uh, because it, um... My upbringing clearly explains some of the choices I made in my life. And as I told you, I was born in Italy and because my father is Italian, my mother is Colombian. And was, uh, when I was 10 years old, we moved to Colombia, we came here. And uh, we started living in Bogota. And because we didn't speak Spanish, Yet we understood Spanish because my mother used to um, speak to us in Spanish. So we went to the Italian school, Leonardo da Vinci, Colegio Italiano mm -hmm. Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, we stayed there for like a year. And um, that's how, in a certain way, I met Colombian society because my classmates at the time were like a middle class, high class uh, children. And so I had uh, some of my classmates were children, the daughter of the son of uh, some ambassador in Bogota. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what, that was my socialization, primary so socialization, which is the, like one of the main, uh, well, the, the way, in a certain way, how you understand the world when you're a child. And um, we stayed there for like a year. And then my parents decided that they wanted to live in the countryside. So we went, uh, we went uh, to Tabio, which is a mm -hmm. town like two hours from Bogota. And uh, because in Italy, you know, like, well, in Europe, the public, the public school, public education is very good. It's, yeah. There's no like a huge difference uh, between between public education and private education uh, as in Colombia or Latin America. Mm. Uh, so they thought that it was a very good idea that we studied in the public school here in Pavia. So I started studying like with the with uh, the children of peasants because mm -hmm. that was three years ago so this is like very well not like countryside like not very uh how do you say well it's it's really close to bogota it's not that far 
it's not Guainia, Guaviare, no, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's still Cundinamarca, but we had like, a, it was like a very different experience from what we had in Bogota. Mm -hmm. So, and in the weekend, because during the week I went to the public school and then in the weekend I used to uh, play and to meet um, some my friends uh, who were uh, themselves middle class children mm. that they it, that like my parents decided that we uh, that we studied here in Tabio and the parents of my my parents friends decided that it was a good idea to that they went that they went to Bogota to study mm -hmm. so I had like I in a way that was my that's how I met uh, uh, like the unequal Colombian society. That's mm -hmm. that's how that's how. Well, you know, as a child, you don't understand that intellectually. It's more like a feeling. It's a it's a it's a certain it's a it's an experience that stayed with me until well many years after that. I started to understand why it was that way. Mm. And why it was like uh, this huge split between classes and this huge difference, uh, yes, between classes and also um, in, in relationship to um, education. Mm. It's it's an incredibly difficult thing to imagine, isn't it? I you're 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 in a public school in well the, the near countryside to Bogota, but with farmers' children and humble people and and yet your social life at the weekend is probably at the italian club uh, as, as they say in the middle class and so this this was a, a very formative experience leading you to i don't know when when was it that you said this cannot continue well i also i want to say something and mm -hmm. as as i i grew up and i started understand it that it was me who had this upbringing like uh, and my friends didn't have it so it's not that i knew more than they did it's just that i understood that i had like a different upbringing and that was one of the reasons why i made some choices mm -hmm. well obviously i could have made no choices at all and because it's a uh, it's a mix of things. It's not just uh, your uh, socialization. It's also other things. And in my case, uh, it was I. Then I went to other schools, but always in Tabio. And then uh, the last two years, um, I decided that I wanted to validate validation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And well, there's some validation institutes in in bogota and i decided to go I, I wanted because i had been in like in so many schools i wanted to finish my high school like very fast and then i had uh, the opportunity to go to canada to learn english i stayed there i did grade 12 i stayed there for like a year and when i was in canada i started to i started my activist life in a way because it was the moment of um, a anti-globalization anti protests mm. in Seattle, but that was <laughs> before in in Quebec, uh, and and what was very interesting is that I I was in Canada and uh, in in the United States traveling and meeting all these activists, and and they and some of them would ask me like so how is the um what about the armed conflict in colombia what do you know about it and uh, what do you think about guerrillas and the farc and ELM? and i didn't know anything i was like 16 17 years old mm -hmm. so that i also i understood that like in um, in high school in like uh, in both public schools and private schools like colombian history um like they don't tell you everything mm -hmm. you know it's uh 
like uh, it's like I started to feel that there was like a huge part of Colombian history that I didn't know about mm. or, or about the social conflict. So middle class and high class people usually they get to know the conflict uh, through media, through television, mm -hmm. through newspapers. And so I started to think about it and it, it was like a movie inception. I, I had like mm -hmm. the idea. <laughs> And uh, and when I came back, I was like, no, I think I, I want to study sociology. I want to go to the National University, Universidad Nacional, because I thought that it would it would be very helpful for me um, to understand uh, why there was like this conflict so long. Why it had been so long? How did it? Uh, how did it start and all those questions that you had when you are like 20 years old and mm. and you start to and you want to study sociology mm -hmm. so did you did you go to the Universidad Nacional then yes but just three semesters so it's something that I don't tell anybody uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> well it's just <laughs> no it's something that I don't right on my cv because it was mm. it was just like three semesters and that was where uh, uh, the people from the FARC were the, the thing that I, the, what i write in the introduction and from the communist clandestine party uh, it's like you know the public university is like a, a, a place where they recruit people for their parties and movements. So you did you did three semesters there and were you you know obviously what year was this? So we are stuck out oh, well that, that that's something also very interesting. It's that uh, it was the Abar Uribe's first government. So oh, we are yeah. talking about uh, 2002. Yeah that's that's when i started university and i remember uh one of the teachers in in one class it was like introduction to sociology i think she was uh, talking about the end of the Taguan's peace process mm. with yeah. pastrana and how that would uh, would start like uh uh, war again and it was uh, so bad for the country and that we had to think about it and about and she started uh, talking about the importance of peace and, um, and I think that was like the only contact with what was happening in the country because the rest was studying Marx, Weber, Durkheim, like the the classics of sociology and and some of some of uh, my um, classmates and i we were like because you know the sociology, sociology department in the national university was founded uh, by um Fals borda mm -hmm. the famous sociologist and camilo torres Mm -hmm. The priest that decided that wanted to go to be a guerrilla member. So we had like this story about the origins of the discipline, and uh, like it it wasn't it was very different from what we were living at that time. It was also the Uribe's uh, this is the start of of his government, the beginning of his government, and. Uh, so many things were changing about uh, well about mm -hmm. how people were thinking about the armed conflict mm -hmm. and the terrorism the war uh, the war to, um, on terrorism and uh, so all the things uh, in a way like i started to think about it and that's how I I thought that I wanted to um, militate to be in a party, mm. and that's how I met the the communist 
the Colombian Communist Party. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so they were, you were, you joined the Partido Clandestine, Comunista Clandestina Colombiana, so the PCC. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and this is a, I mean, we can say, I think, it's a political wing, like a legitimate political wing of the FARC. Yes, it was because, well, some Colombian history is that we all know that the guerrilla in the world, they have a, a, like a political wing, as you mm -hmm. say, like a party. And for many years, uh, the FARC had like a close relationship with the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. But in the 90s, with the end uh, of the Cold War and the um, and all those changes and the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the Communist Party decided to split with the FARC. Like uh, there was like so many groups uh, started saying that you know the armed uh, struggle was not useful anymore and uh, was like was the end of that time, no? Because we yeah. all know that the sixties and seventies there were so many guerrillas in the world, not just in Colombia. And so in, in, in a way they they like they broke in, in that relationship with the FARC. So the FARC decided to create their own party. Mm -hmm. And it was clandestine, mm -hmm. of course, because the FARC were a terrorist organization and uh, but it was more like more like political. It was a way to study uh, Colombian history and mm -hmm. to start to to have uh, some well to understand the story of the FARC and mm -hmm. uh, well, it was a first ap approximation to the to the political history Colombian political history and is... uh, yes no go, no go on go. please no, and then, then of course, uh, because the FARC it's a, was a present organization, they needed uh, people from the city to give, uh, to help, to educate, even in some basic things like teaching, uh, to read, something, but also like in, in, in a political way, because there were, there's always this idea that the FARC are like an armed and political organization. So they have, um, they had like in, in, in the, in the mountains, in the mountains on weekends, they had like this party meetings where they would have uh, like a, a political lessons in a way during the war, in the middle of the war. Um, so they like, once you had like some, once you had been like some, you had been maybe some months in, in the party, they, they, they asked you like, do you want to go and like meet, go to the mountains and meet this other part of like the, the armed guerrilla? Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and well, some of us would say yes, and other would say no, and in my case, of course, I, I wanted to, well, I wanted to understand. I wanted to see by my by myself what was happening in the in the in the mountains. Mm. So you went up. I mean, after after a while, you went up to see, and di I mean, did you? Is this the way? But I, what, from what I understand, you remained a political activist. But in your introduction in the book, I mean, you, you do say you were a member of the FARC. Yes, well, I don't say a member. I said I stayed in a... Oh, yeah. Well, informal, because I was, I was telling you, informal, uh, mm. in a formal way, I was still a member of the party. But mm. once you are in the middle of the war, once you are with them and you... you and end up like doing the the things that they do, mm -hmm. uh, and they teach you. And and actually, at the time was 
surviving the war because it was the Plan Patriota, mm. no, which uh, the Plan Patriota that was uh, before because Plan Patriota started in Cundinamarca. Yeah, it was uh, a plan to they wanted to kill the main the guerrilla main commanders, mm. and they started doing that in Cundinamarca, and then they went to Meta and other departments and uh, and that was and that was the moment that it was there so it was like uh, just surviving the war mm. yeah it, it, the quote i found it here is, is viví algunos de los peores momentos del plan patriota la campaña militar más grande contra las farc ep lanzada por el gobierno de álvaro uribe y aún en ese contexto nunca aguantamos hambre and there you are so, um uh, but then i mean uh what can i say what was the year that you left then because you went to university you left to go to university in in paris yes no then i stayed there for for some years and mm. this is an experience this is an experience i would like to write and i, mm -hmm. I would like to write in another moment because <laughs> yeah and uh and and because I, I i as i say in the introductions i in an introduction i talked to some people about my experience and some of them uh, told me like you shouldn't tell your story but first because of security issues and mm. also because they because they said like you were not you didn't become like a commander. You were not like an important figure. And uh, for some years, I used to think, I, I thought about it. And then I said, well, I think this is an experience. I, I, I'm not saying that it's a very, I'm not comparing to other experiences, but it's, it's a way, uh, it's a way to tell, to talk about the conflict the mm. way to tell the conflict it's uh mm. um yeah it's um and it's this standpoint from a woman a mm. middle class woman uh, which is not like the majority of the farc and uh, and also a woman that you know i couldn't go out because uh, in the moment that they asked me like uh, do you want to stay here for the rest of your life? Basically, after some years, the commander asked me, like, do you want to stay here? And I said, no, I, I because I knew what was uh, living uh, in the mountains during the war. And uh, I, I thought that I, maybe I could help in other ways. Mm. And I wanted to go, I wanted to study and I wanted to go back to university. Mm. So I said no, and I left. And they said, and they told me like, okay, you can leave, and now you can you can restart your life, and uh, in the future we will see again. It was something like that. And is, yeah, and, and, and I, I'm just going to interrupt. It's an incredible uh, contrast with uh, an interview I had a few a few weeks ago with an author, uh, you know, from an upper class Bogotana family who had to leave because the uh, I, I think it was the M19 was going to uh, kidnap her brother or no they, no they kidnapped her brother for six months and she had to leave but she has done an investigation that's run for more than 12 or 14 years into the life of a young girl from Putumayo who went in into the FARC but was largely I mean, largely used as a sex slave when she was very young, and you know the commander's girl, and so on. And I, I find it fantastic, uh, just really fascinating these these different levels. Um, yes, you know, within within the FARC itself, and this is something that's very much coming to light as we talk about the jurisdicción especial para la paz and everything else. And uh, uh, you know, um, I can't remember. One of the top ranking uh, female uh, FARC, women FARC members who's in Congress, and I can't remember her name. Um, I was talking to her, and she's, you know, she was saying that women never get to the very top. Uh, and yes. it's, this is, you know, this has to be someone who's educated, such as yourself, 
you have to see the limitations as well. Yes. Yeah, mm. that's right. And also, it's not that I, my dream wasn't being a commander. Mm. Also, I was like, oh, I want to be. But I knew that it was going to be very difficult. And, and, also, and, 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 and it's the thing is that, you know, being a commander, like, it could be like so many years and you could, you could die any moment mm. because yeah. I almost died myself and uh, I was almost killed. So I also survived. And uh, what you're saying, yes, I had, because it, like my experience would sound like a cliche in a way, it's like this romantic view of the farm, but it, it, it's not that at all, because I, you know, I, of course, I, I know that the, the for kidnap kidnapped it that there were so many victims i'm very conscious about it uh, mm -hmm. but of course i also believed in other things and that's how that's why i went mm -hmm. because if i had only the vision of uh, uh, the guerrilla are the worst thing in the country and in the world i wouldn't be there mm -hmm. and and another other thing that i that i wanted to say it's and this um, when you are in the mountains you don't know anything about what it's going on around you you know like what the commanders say you know that and because it was like a huge army and i was in the oriental block mm -hmm. block oriental and i was like in a very small unit like i didn't know you know, some meters away, there could be like more guerrilla, and I didn't know that because mm. this is very clandestine. Like you don't know what it's going on um, around you. So, mm. what happened in Havana, in Cuba, when mm. uh, the fire commanders met the, the some victims of the, of the conflict? was we re was really a turning point because some of us understood like the the pain and the, and what what had happened mm. to other people you know so mm. it's uh, uh yeah it's 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 very it's it's very um, i mean what i'm what i'm saying is that either like propaganda it's either it's both a uh, the democratic security uh, narrative which says that guerrilla uh, is the worst uh, like the main problem in colombia is the are the guerrillas mm. that and we know that it's not like that and uh, also the guerrilla propaganda which says that they didn't do anything wrong and they were only victims also of uh, some social conditions like both uh, of both narratives are wrong. Mm. So in in a way, I can I can I could see how, I could see why the guerrilla uh, was very appealing for some people, but mm. I could also see why uh, like they they had no future because there were so many things that uh, were wrong. Mm. I. I, this, I have a few more questions about your time in the guerrilla, and then we'll get on to some of the context of the book because I think it's so fascinating as well. Would I mean when you got, let's say, uh, uh, you you joined the uh, Partido Comunista Clandestina Colombiana, so the clandestine uh, Communist Party of Colombia? Would you say you were young and impressionable? It was easy for them to almost draw you in. Would you say that? it was more of a condition of your age that they were able to sort of, or, or you were genuinely politically uh, driven to, to become part of the group, uh, the PSSC. Well, this is something that I, I've been thinking about because of course now I think I wouldn't go mm. the guerrilla. Of mm. course, it's something that is related to your age, something that you do when you're young. But life itself is this way, like you, you understand first intellectually and then you have the experience. Mm. 
Mm. It's when uh, at that age, for example, while I was in the guerrilla at that age, like 24, uh, my mother got pregnant. So uh, she, like, she intellectually knows what it's been a mother, what it's, how it's going to be like, but you have, you don't have the experience. Mm. So intellectually, I knew the Colombian history. I knew that this like was disgusting, an equal society, the Colombian society. I knew that I wanted to do something to fix that. Uh, I wanted to be with other people that thought the same way as I did. And um, I thought that, you know, like middle class people were not do were not doing anything. And I, wa I was very curious also. I wanted mm. to know like what was happening in the mountains and why it was different from what was uh, uh, streaming on television. Mm. And uh, I knew all that in my head, but you know, I didn't have the experience. So mm. um, I, I was very, I, for example, they, you know, armed conflict or war, like, all of most of us talked about the Colombian war, but you know we don't have the experience of what it's been to be like uh, be um, to live and to be under attack, for example, mm. in the mountains or other yeah. things related to war. Yeah. Now. You mentioned at one point that you, you know you were up there for several years and you almost died. You were almost killed. Can you can you tell us a bit about that experience? Well, yes. Well, um, yes. As I told you, it was like an intense uh, period of war because it was the Plan Patriota, and what happened because after what happened in the Caguans peace process is that the guerrilla stopped being like a mobile guerrilla because the mm -hmm. um how do you say like the main characteristic of guerrilla it's uh, that they move all the time right mm -hmm. so and and they have uh, an advantage um uh, uh, that the army the the like the official army uh, don't, don't have and mm -hmm. it's that they know they know the the place where they are like they know the mountains and they know the people and that's the strength of a guerrilla mm -hmm. so what happened also with uh, the paramilitaries and the counter guerrilla that that the army created was that the army started uh, going to the places where the guerrilla was Mm -hmm. you know? So they started to, in a certain way, to occupy their territories, and so the guerrilla had to go, um, like almost in the jungles, where no connection at all with the uh, mm -hmm. population and people that could help them. And so it was; it, they had to move all the time. And uh, in the Taguan peace process, they moving because they had like this huge area uh, mm -hmm. zona de extensión mm -hmm. uh, that was for them was for them and they could stay there and uh, they just uh, started to live like a normal life mm -hmm. so when that process um, broke they went to their life they had like in the 80s and in the 70s when they started to grow and it was like uh, moving all the time. You couldn't stay like a night or two nights. It's because, and also the, there's also the aviation, the aviation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the aviation. Like the air, the aviation, the, like the, they were, that was they were something that you. the army. Yes, and they didn't do that before. Mm -hmm. So then, so you start moving all the time, and uh, there's. In a, there's a moment that you don't have fear anymore. You are not like because you are so used to hear the bombings and and the shots and everything. 
and uh, and um, and it was you know, like it was I was wounded twice like the first uh, the first um, time was like at the very beginning so I don't know why they sent me like uh, to the La Cortina it's like the main uh, when there's like a a combat mm, so you so have like, like the, the army yeah yes they sent me like to the front and i didn't have weapons so i i i don't know why i was there and uh, so uh, one of the guerrilla had like a uh, mortero mm -hmm. and and it exploded and one of the i was wounded like in um <laughs> I, uh, how do you say pulmon? Lung in your lung. In, in my lung, yes. That's so, really, really dangerous. Yes, I could have died, but they had like yeah. uh, this, the the people. Well, they have doctors and also they have uh, enfermeros, like very mm -hmm. good ones. But they are so mm -hmm. used to to operate and to in the in the jungle and so I was able they they were able to well that they it's um they put you like a two thorax inside mm -hmm. into your you thorax know. it's like this yeah into, yes and uh well <laughs> so that was the and one the experience why, <laughs> like that was the one and that and all this while they were like bombing Ugh. all the time so it was a it was a very strong experience and Ugh. the second one the second one was just uh an ambuscade an ambush an ambush an ambush um, an ambush and i was wounded in the arm but the, mm. sh the shot like didn't get the the bone just the mm. flesh so it wasn't that that i yes you must you must suffer post traumatic stress syndrome I, you must yes i did yeah. Yeah. i did yeah. well most of the most of the people that uh, go through those experiences the soldiers mm. that go to war experience that in a yeah, in a way yes. definitely uh i mean to, I think we could talk and I could listen to your tales and your stories from the Monte and the Bloque Oriental. Who was in charge of the Bloque Oriental at that time? Well, at that time it was uh, Jorge Urizeno, uh, Mono Hoy. Uh, yeah. Mono Hoy, that's what I thought. Uh, but, but you, you know, I think I could listen to these for hours and I know, but, you know, I, I do want to talk about a bit about your book and and also you are going to write your next your memoirs you are going to write about your memoirs. experiences and so so i will read those and we'll have you back on to talk about that again but i think i want to talk about your your book uh, colombia una herida que no cierra because it's again it's very academic and you go through all the different peace processes in the 1980s and you know i know a fair bit but not into the minutia that you have gone because i know you did this as your master's mm. thesis at the universidad de sao paulo in brazil but there are things that really jump out to me um as someone who sort of studies language and writes and it's the way that you you really clarify terminologies um how you know there was guerrilla and then there was narco guerrilla or narco paramilitary or I found another one as well, the different phases of the government, the paramilitaries and the guerrillas. And uh, the, these are the things that really they got to me. And you've kind of touched on it a bit earlier when you were talking about sort of the end of the Cold War. And then the terminology changes and the way that, let's say, you know, a, a group such as the FARC is then is then seen. Um, but I, I, do, I have to ask because everyone will ask the FARC started out you know as as farmers uh wishing for land and again very basic very brutish <laughs> uh, to say that <laughs> um 
but then of course marginalized stigmatized they get involved in in everything else but they you know the fuck has been involved in in uh, coca production right i mean it's not it's when they say no we only taxed coca growers the fuck was involved of, of course it was right yes but in the 80s was not no it's either, this is the way no, the terminology no. goes along hand with it yes Yes, mm. what I like, what I discovered because I didn't know it because, of course, I I was studying that and I it was I was learning as well, mm. is that they started like in order to attack those peace processes because there are so many people interested mm. in that in uh, not making peace, mm. uh, is that that was one of the um, main ways to attack the peace process it was saying that they were uh, narco guerrilla and terrorist mm -hmm. in a moment when they were not mm. when they were not well were, they were not in the business i'm not saying yeah. that they would go in the business before that and and of course some of the regions because in my case like i can i cannot say that i saw something related to a uh, uh, narcotrafico in the guerrilla mm -hmm. but of course in the south well yeah. we know there are some regions and everything so it, it depends it depends on so many things but in uh, in the moment in the 80s they were not they it was just uh, they they had like this uh, relationship with the coca productions uh, through the mm -hmm. gramaje yeah, Gramaje, which was like a um, um, like a tax. Yeah, they... so a, a, a tax on the on the coca harvested, then made into yes. paste and so on. But let's go into the let's go in, because most I say a huge amount of my listeners aren't going to know so much about the the peace accords of the nineteen eighties, and and I think what's so revealing is the quantity of guerrilla groups that there were. Um, that I think that's it, it's almost shocking, which which goes to show you know, the unrest and the unsettled nature of of Colombia at the time. I mean, you know, yes. when you think of all the different uh, groups and revolutionary groups and the Quintinlame and everything else, it just goes to show. And so you go through each one and through each different uh, um, president, and I I think the one that caught my eye the most was a sort of the the period of Belisario Betancourt, where if if I'm not mistaken, the idea of peace is just to demobilize. Uh, it's just is 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 that right? No, I, I in the, what I what I do with my work, or, or mm. my, the purpose of this work is to relate the peace process with the political regime, mm -hmm. which was the 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 this motto of the National Front. Because we are used to understand the peace process just as the peace process, like the negotiation table, like some actors from the, like the, um, the team from the government, and then we have like the mm. team from the FARC, and then the, what they negotiate and everything. And we don't see what is going on like mm. in, the, in the country, like in the, like in the political, uh, mm. sphere and to in order to understand those processes in, in the 80s for me it was very important to understand what was going on in the country in terms of yeah. uh, the political elites they wanted really to dismantle the national front because at the time they thought that all those guerrillas as you were saying like eight mm. groups were the result of uh, this uh, of this lack of democracy in the political mm -hmm. system. And so in order to demobilize all those guerrillas, they had to make this like a political opening, the apertura mm -hmm. democratica, which meant to dismantle the national front and to create uh, a new constitution, mm -hmm. you know, which is like the, uh, 91 constitution mm -hmm. and uh, so we had like a very different understanding of what it meant to have to what was a peace process 
and the relationship with the political regime. And also, uh, Belisario Tancur started talking about the objective causes of violence, mm. which means uh, understanding the structural um, reasons, like the, the, the objective re reasons why uh, some people decide to go to the guerrilla. It's not mm. just, uh, of course, there are like, you can be, let's say, uh, obligado, forced. Uh, yeah. Forced. Of course, there are some people that are forced to go there, but there are some reasons also that explain mm. why uh, some yeah. people decide to 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 join the guerrillas. Mm. Um, I, it is interesting. This I I we need we need to jump around because but those who are interested, please, please buy Sara's book. Colombia, una herida que no cierra. This will be obviously on all of our social media pages. But I wanted to ask you about current events right now as well, because I'm obviously you are very active. Uh, you're very critical of the current uh, government on Twitter or X. Uh, and since we've been in conversation and since when this uh, in, uh, conversation goes out, well, Salvatore Mancuso, uh, the famed and feared uh, leader of the paramilitary groups from Cordoba, but who ran much of the, you know, northern Colombia, has finished his 15 days, nine months, four, uh, you know, 50, sorry, 15 years, nine months, four days sentence, and is back in Colombia. And he's now going to be a gestor de paz. Now, you are an expert on peace accords. How do you feel? about this guy being involved do you, i mean i i all i can think of is that he has promised promised a lot of things to the government so that he can be included in the jurisdicción especial para la paz and not admit to everything this is all i can feel but what do you feel about this well you know what i feel about this is that there are some and there are some actors of the conflict the army the guerrilla and the paramilitaries mm. but an internal armed conflict is like those armies are related to the uh, political elites to civil mm -hmm. society yes because because well because of the recruitment process and everything but also in the case of the paramilitaries they were created by some political elites like they're, they're not just they were born just like because you know mm. a spontaneous generation that they are they were like financed like people gave money and uh, keep people gave also knowledge and training and everything in order to create those groups. So mm. what I'm thinking, because because Mancuso uh, gets here at the same time where the guerrilla commanders are not very um, satisfied with what they have is doing, right? Mm. And they are, and they also, and DLN also we have to have like a such a justice um a justice um a justice system different from the head mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so what i see is that is that everything is related and uh, what they are like in a way pushing and uh, trying to uh, to address is that uh, the third parties that also uh, are part of the conflict they have they they have to talk as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, like yes Mancuso has like we know the relationship with the, with with some uh, enterprises and the paramilitaries but we we still don't know the names yeah some of the names mm. So I think it would be interesting if 
this person, if Mancuso tells the truth, and uh, I mean, like it, it doesn't have to be only Mancuso, it should be everybody. Yeah. You know? All the people telling the truth, not just Mancuso. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that case, I, I think from what he has said, I think he has a genuine uh, will to, to tell things. And I think they should be new things. And, and, uh, and I think other political actors also, they have, they start to talk because, because, because the arm, the Colombian armed conflict goes like very well beyond the paramilitarist guerrilla and the army. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's deep into society and, yes. uh, I, uh, interviewed, uh, last year I interviewed, uh, the. Uh, Professor Jenny Pierce from London School of Economics, mm -hmm. who's, who's doing a, a book should come out this year about the elites in Colombia mm -hmm. and and so on. And it's it's fascinating. Well, the report was fascinating, and it goes a long way to explaining a lot of things. Um, uh, again, as I said, Sarah, I think I could listen to you and your experiences and your knowledge for hours but unfortunately we don't have more time. <laughs> the time but but promise me that in the future that we will talk again uh and uh, before your book other book is out because i know that you will continue to be a feature uh, in uh, sociological and political circles when it taught when we're, we're discussing the Colombian uh, peace accords and peace accords in general but of course here in Colombia so Sara Tufano thank you so much for your time here on the Colombia Calling podcast well, thank you so much Richard for, for inviting me and for listening to this story and for your questions and for your interest <laughs> Well, you know, I live here. It's been a few years now, and it's something that somehow I'm going to have to start telling my older yeah. son, you know, who's eight, you know, okay. and I'm going to start. He, yeah. he, he, had to, he asked me about, oh, are we in war? And I was like, well, let's, let's start. But he's eight, and I, I know. But so, everybody, please, you can find uh, Sarah's book in all good bookshops here in Bogota and around the country. Sarah Tufano, that's T U F A N O. Colombia, una herida que no cierra. If you really want to get into the peace accords and the political situations in the 1980s in Colombia, so much of which is overlooked today, and you can start seeing patterns of errors taking place, uh, get this book. I highly recommend it. And uh, yes, I read it in two sittings. So there you go. Sara, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for your time, and I wish you all the best on your doctorate investigations there in Sao Paulo, because I know you're off next week. Yes, no, thank you so much, Richard, for everything. Okay. Well, this has been the Columbia Calling Podcast. I've been Richard McCall talking to Sara Tufano. Uh, we'll be back next week with another interview and conversation with someone Columbia-related. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.